my name is Min Lee, and my position at the, my company is uh, I'm kind of like the head development for a, a new project uh, being developed at Pro this. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're here at GDC. Uh, this is the first time in, how, how long has it been since you've been to a GDC? Uh, well, it's been a while. Actually, the last one I went to was in uh, 2008, 2009. So <laughs> it's good. It's been like Almost uh, 10 years. seven years. Yeah, seven or eight years. Okay, wow. And that was actually for a previous project that I work on. Uh, called Tactical Intervention, which didn't turn out so well, actually. <laughs> but, oh, no. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'll talk about it if you, want, <laughs> if you want. I'm not embarrassed about it. But yeah, sure. I mean, uh, if you want, like, I can talk about that. But <laughs> that was, it was a good, it was an interesting experience for me. And uh, um, I, I learned a lot from that. And, you know, I got a chance to work with some pretty uh, passionate people. But unfortunately, it was, that project kind of failed because we, we kind of, we bit off more than we can chew. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, we were just, we were just too small and we had trouble uh, basically just growing uh, and, and just uh, as a company growing basically and so yeah it just the project itself was just doomed to fail. Oh, mm. So let's talk about something that wasn't doomed to fail. What brought you back here this year uh, to GDC? Oh okay so yeah so I joined Pearl Abyss uh, about a year ago now and um, so uh, they, they, they hired me to work on a new project that's kind of it's based on uh, it's an FPS it's a shooting game so they, they kind of have a, a lot of um, uh, uh, kind of they admired my work on previous uh, shooting games like Counter Strike and some, so they were big fans of, of uh, my work on those games and they wanted to get my expertise on on their new project. So, so so I joined Pearl Abyss to to do just that, and uh, my position there is basically to just kind of oversee this new project and just kind of uh, help kind of get the shooting mechanics right and. So, so yeah, that's been uh, what I've been doing at, at Pro Abyss for the past year, just working on this new project that, unfortunately, I can't really say much about, but I, I can say that it involves shooting, and uh, it's, it's going to be a shooter. Um, that's, that's cool. Um, I kind of want to talk to you about just the state of shooters right now. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, you, you're, you're, you're from the old school yeah. of FPS devs, you know, yeah. very much... That, I've been around for a while, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and things are different right now. Yeah, there's yeah, a new there's a new paradigm evolved. with battle royale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it almost feels like when deathmatch was invented, mm -hmm. it's that with transformative. Quake, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, like 20 years ago, we had Quake and we had Unreal and we had like Doom, and you know, eventually we started getting uh, the, the the FPS genre started to get more granular. You know, then Counter Strike came along. And you know the the player base started to split up. You know we started getting like the, we still had the people that played deathmatch, but then people started playing Counter Strike. So we had this kind of esports thing where people would would play like games that were focused on like uh, competitive esports. And now like now we've got games like PUBG, like battle royale style games. So you know the the FPS genre has even splintered even further. So you know we've got like uh, even more like subcategories of of of, of uh, FPS type games, you know, so we, we still have the Call of Duty uh, uh, players and we still have the Battlefield players and we still have the uh, Counter-Strike players, but now we've got this new subset of players like that love Battle Royale. So so I, I see I sort of see the splintering of, 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 of the player base just kind of falling into their own kind of like uh, play style, you know. And it's happening at a time where these games, especially these Battle Royale games, right? Fortnite, uh, yeah. Apex Legends, not Apex Legends, but Fortnite and PUBG, mm -hmm. they're both available on mobile devices. Yeah. So they've made this huge leap. And I know we, we've seen Rage in the past, other games in the past be ported to mobile, but mm -hmm. the the ability to play cross-play with mobile devices, I think, is this huge paradigm shift for yeah. online multiplayer. Right, yeah. Uh, but are they able? To, uh, when you say crossplay, they're not able to play with the PC uh, player base. No, no, no. They they're keep not. them. They it's keep just, them. Yeah, it's just totally separate. Because I, I mean, it, it would. Uh, yeah, for sure. It would be completely unbalanced. Yeah. Quake Three was on uh, Dreamcast. And yeah. They had crossplay. With yeah, it was terrible, <laughs> man. Like, and like Xbox tried to crossplay with PC. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like they just get they get the, the you know they wipe the floor off like. Yeah. Yeah, and like you know, I mean, I, I see Sony. They're trying to promote like crossplay or and and Microsoft as mm -hmm. well, you know, in their future products. And I'm still kind of skeptical how that's going to play out because, you know, you, it's a huge, like, discrepancy in skill between PC players and console players. I mm -hmm. mean, that's just, it's a matter of fact. You can't really deny that. Because yeah. I've played Rainbow Six on uh, PS4, and I also play it on the PC. And, you know, when I switch over from there, from the mouse and the keyboard to the gamepad, my skills just go like this, you know. I, I can't, my, my kill-death ratio is just balloons. 
And yeah, when you look at the it's a huge difference. Yeah. And when you look at the professional scene for FPS, yeah, it's still keyboard and mouse. Oh yeah, for sure. Because everyone wants that precision and that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when I play on the PS4, you know, as I said, I even play a lot of pro guys, you know, who who play with the gamepad as well, and they're, you know, they're just not as good as the guys who play on the with with the mouse and. Yeah, you yeah, mentioned so. something about so, the splintering. Uh, yeah, cross plays, it's, yeah. it's difficult. He's mentioned something about the splintering of FPS that mm -hmm. I thought was interesting. Yeah. And you, you really cited Counter-Strike as one of those moments. The bomb planted, right, bomb mm -hmm. diffused, that mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that aha moment like? And how did you, did you know at that moment that you had created something that was 20 years later was still <laughs> going to be played for hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars in arenas. Did you like <laughs> the, the, that that like germ of an idea? Yeah, it, it's weird. No, you, you know because when I originally came up with Counter Strike, the first mode that we had was hostage rescue, and that was kind of my first uh, motivation to make Counter Strike because counter terrorism actually the majority of counter terrorist operations they're really about hostage rescue. You don't really see. You know, you, you never see in real life people, terrorists, planting bombs like that, right? Yeah. And they're not going to stick around, right? That's stupid, right? In real life, that whole bomb scenario came out because, um, you know, it's weird. We just came up with that scenario because we knew terrorists use bombs, but they use them in, in, in a, like in mostly about car bombings and that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. So we, when we came up with the, the, the idea of the, the, the bomb scenario, we, we had to make it balanced so the terrorists wouldn't just plant it and run away. You know, so it was kind of uh, it was difficult to 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 get that that balance right in, in having it. You know, they had to plan it, and they had like 30 seconds. So um, yeah, we never we never imagined that it would really become the de facto gameplay of Counter Strike because these days when you play Counter Strike, it's 90% gonna be bomb mode, right? I'm kind of curious. Uh, what did you think was gonna be the big breadwinner for, for Counter, Counter Strike? Strike? Well, I, I, honestly, I hoped it would be hostage rescue, but in, unfortunately, hostage rescue was just too hard to balance. It was just way too. Um, it just it was hard to balance the maps, and it was hard to balance just the gameplay of, of hostage rescue because it's just too biased for the the terrorists because they yeah. have such so much of an advantage. So it was very difficult for us to to just make it so uh, you know it was just you know on par with the counter terrorists. So in the end, that's kind of why uh, the bomb defusal just became much more uh, 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 friendly for esports because it was just uh, it was just one of those 50/50 game modes that just worked out in the end. And yeah, yeah. When when you had this idea to make Counter Strike or you know to create the mod, uh, how'd you go about doing that? Like when did you decide to actually uh, create what you did? So <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean at the time uh, I was just. I was a big player, uh, I was a big, uh, like, uh, uh, I, I was part of a clan that used to play a lot of, like, Quake uh, mm -hmm. Deathmatch. And what was the clan? Do you remember? I, I forgot the name. It's crazy. We're, yeah. we're getting so old that we God. forget what clans we were in. Yeah, no. Uh, it was never a big clan, you know, we never really took off. And it, but uh, it was, we were pretty skilled at the time. I mean, I remember whenever we played on public scrims, we would be, like, top we would always be in the top five of, 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 of 30 players. Because, I mean, back then, I think it was like uh, 16 players. So 16 mm -hmm. on 16, or, or was it uh, eight on eight? But anyways, mm -hmm. we would always be in the top five. So we were a pretty good clan. But uh, one of the th problems I had with the Quake Deathmatch was it was just, uh, there was no t uh, teamwork. You know, it was really just kind of singular, kind of like individual skill. Yeah, about having your route and mm -hmm. running it. Yes, exactly. Then, yeah, there and wasn't there yeah. wasn't a whole lot of communication back then. We didn't have Discord or anything. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so that's kind of my impetus for making Counter-Strike was I wanted uh, a, a game that would kind of encourage uh, game uh, like uh, teamwork and, and just have, have players kind of work together a bit more. So uh, I was I was hoping Counter-Strike would be that and, you know, Thankfully, it, it kind of it did become I, that. I think it's becoming in a really big way because you look at uh, what's going on with CSGO now mm -hmm. and these massive mm -hmm. tournaments. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you, and even like uh, the Rainbow Six Siege as well has, has yeah. really emulated uh, the success of CSGO uh -huh. and kind of put their own spin on it. But I think it's yeah. the drama of these games and mm -hmm. the, the loop of the games that make it so compelling on a, on a service like Twitch. Yeah. To watch, yeah. Uh, there's other FPSs out there. Yeah, yeah, like COD and Battlefield. But yeah, CS:GO. I, I think Counter Strike. The formula for Counter Strike is really am amenable to to esports and, and to just Twitch view viewership because it it really is a, a pretty simple uh, gameplay mechanic and um, 
the levels are, are, are actually designed really well in that they're just so balanced and they, and they really, um, they kind of allow the, 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 the flow of the, the players to, to kind of just, yeah, move about in a much more, yeah. I, I really think uh, it's, it's, it's so important for a viewership standpoint, like on an eSports uh, viewpoint, mm -hmm. that you can have never played the game yeah. and sit there and watch it and within a few minutes understand what's going on. Yeah. And I think that's true of, of Counter-Strike. Yeah, because it's so simple. It's just guns, shooting, and planting the bomb. There's, there's not a whole lot of... Uh, uh, you know, when, when I watch Overwatch, you know, as a new player, I've never played Overwatch, and I watch and I'm like, what is going on here, right? So it, it, there's a bit of a learning curve, but with Counter-Strike, it is simple and it's pure in that sense. And I think a lot of players kind of gravitate towards that. And, and I think that's kind of why it's kind of remained pretty popular even to even 20 years on to like today's standards, right? Uh, what do you think of like the esports scene in general nowadays? Are you are you a fan? Do you do you watch a lot of competitive gameplay? Uh, I watch it casually. I mean, I don't keep up with it uh, too much. It's it's very uh, uh, it, there's so much going on with it. But it's definitely uh, it, it's very compelling for me to when I watch a lot of the CS:GO tournaments and I see how how good some of these players are and how how the how it's evolved and uh, and you know I mean it does, hasn't really changed much like when I watch uh, some of the the CS:GO tournaments today uh, like the skills that they're employing and, and the tactics that they're using it's pretty much the same as what they were doing 10 years ago you know because uh, I think Valve have, has kept CS:GO uh, the gameplay of CS:GO pretty pretty uh, kind of like consistent in, in that they haven't really changed that 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 uh, feel of the game uh, over the over the over the past 20 years, I would say. So, and I think that is uh, that is kind of the key to the uh, the longevity of CS:GO. It's a lot of the players that play today, a lot of the skills that they were they were they were training themselves for. They've been doing it for five years, and the, and because of that, the game hasn't changed, and they were able to carry their skills along with the game. But when you look at games like Call of Duty or Battlefield, they're always kind of introducing, like, uh, that's why, <clears throat> if you look at those games, the esports uh, can never really grow with those types of games because they keep reintroducing the gameplay every two or three years, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of like if they just kept adding new rules to, like, Yeah, yeah, and that. they do that in order to, you know, so they can sell the new version. And that's, so it's always kind of interesting to me when I see games, AAA game studios, like, uh, Battlefield try to become esports because to me it just seems so opposite of what they are, are as, as, a, as a game publisher. Their, their mentality is to make a game every two years or every year and you know in order to do that they have to change the game but that that mentality goes against esports. Esports in order for esports to grow it has to be consistent. The, the rule set has to be consistent you know it, it has to be like you look at League of Legends you know it's it hasn't Fundamentally, the rules haven't changed that much over the course of its lifetime. And I think it's a you, you hit on that philosophy where you make one game mm -hmm. and you take care of it over time, and that's how you build an esports community. Yeah, Whereas, sure. That's what Valve has done with CS. Yeah. Or look at Rocket League in recent history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they're not making a Rocket League two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that they that they they allow the community to grow, and and, and that's exactly what Rainbow Six. Uh, Siege has done when I when I look at Ubisoft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Rainbow Six Siege is I don't know two or three years old, I guess. Yes. It's yeah. Years. And it's kind of amazing because when it was first released, it, it didn't do so well, and uh, you know they were really consistent about it in that oh let's just keep supporting and supporting it. And I play it even today. I, I started playing Rainbow Six Siege like six months ago, and you know I can sort of see uh, how much effort has uh, has gone into keep making that game very. Uh, just consistent and, and like the feel of the game very, uh, you know, the rule set has been, hasn't changed too much over the course of three years. You know? Yeah, one thing you, you kind of hinted at, or at least kind of mentioned uh, in this interview is just how many shooters there are mm -hmm. in, in the world now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Like the whole battle royale thing yeah. is kind of like. It feels like <coughs> as it's splintered, the pie has gotten bigger for everyone, but now there's more people after the pie. How do yeah, you yeah. how do you differentiate yourself? Well, it's interesting because you know, like there's only there's only so many FPS players. So every time a new uh, new game comes out, you know, obviously it, it's going to take a lot of players from that uh, from another game. Like whenever uh, when PUBG came out and started to become popular, you started to see less players of CS:GO. You know, because yeah. a lot some of them were kind of trickling over to to PUBG, right? 
but the you know it, it never really died it never really died out like you still have a lot of CSGO players and you still have, but yeah I mean you what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a lot of like the player base is just kind of like moving across each other but I still think that there's still gonna be a uh, a lot of people that's still gonna play Battlefield. They're still gonna play Counter Strike, even though there is a new like battle royale game coming out. Like, you know, mm -hmm. there's uh, they're just gonna be maybe a bit less of them, maybe. And I think they're just gonna the players. They kind of just jump across, you know. Like, well, I, th I think one reason why you see the player base so fickle now is yeah. that a lot of these battle royale games that are popular are free to play. Uh, yeah, yeah. PUBG wasn't, but you know, when you have a sixty dollar Call of Duty or a sixty dollar Battlefield every year, yeah, yeah. versus zero dollars to play for oh yeah it's just easy to just install it check it out and you know get addicted to it right yes yeah, yeah, so i feel sure. like the economics have changed a little bit so yeah how would yeah. Do, you, do you think that that's do you think that game is a service free to play kind of model mm -hmm. uh do you think it has staying power or do you think it's something that only large companies can really afford to implement um i i think it's i think it really is uh, important for you know, I, I think it's a really big draw for, for games to be, be free to play game because there's such a low barrier of entry for players to just, you know, download and check it out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons why Fortnite and Apex has, 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 has helped it become so, so popular in, in such a short amount of time, mm -hmm. you, know? Uh, you know, because of their, their, their free to playness. So I do think free to play is a cer certainly a huge factor mm -hmm. in, in making a, a game uh, growing uh, the player base uh, but is it is it necessary like does a game have to be free to play um i, I don't know i mean like uh, if it's not free to play then you you really have to spend a lot of money on marketing and and th that sort of thing and you have to get the right right price point because yeah nobody's gonna spend 60 bucks for a game and it doesn't offer a, 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 a like drastically different experience than like Apex Legends or whatever you get in Fortnite. Mm -hmm. See, because I think right now the FPS genre is so saturated that you've got so many different game experiences that for, for a developer to come out and, and charge like to ask 30, 40 bucks and, and your game isn't, isn't so drastically different than the existing games, uh, it's, it's, it's a really tough sell, you know. That, that's why I think uh, it's important to be a free to play game, you know. So, uh, in, this, in this day and age. Yeah, you know. going forward though, yeah. like, you know, we've had, we're now in the middle of this Battle Royale paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you already planning for the next curve for your games? Uh, you, what, do, what do you think uh, is... You know, I, I, personally, <laughs> I don't think it's possible to plan for the next, because nobody planned for Battle Royale. It, it came out of the blue. It I was don't a mod. Anybody even saw it, yeah. It, it, much like yourself, it was a mod. You yeah, know, it was yeah, a, yeah. It was a and daisy mod. Exactly. I, and I don't, I don't think uh, game developers like myself, personally, I don't think we're trying to like we're trying to predict the next big yeah. thing because it's just impossible. You know, uh -huh. I mean, like you, you're just gonna, yeah, you're just gonna waste a lot of time and, and resources trying to predict the next big thing. And uh, it's it's easier just to let someone else do it and just kind of copy them. <laughs> and that's what we're seeing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're seeing a lot of battle royale clones. And it, for, I mean, when you look at Triple A uh, Studios, it, for, from that for their standpoint, it's much safer for them to just say, "Oh wow, this is a big hit. Let's just re let's just take that formula and refine it." You know. So yeah. yeah. So you've uh, just you know sort of pivot here, but uh, you've got a few sessions here at GDC. Mm -hmm. um, just you know, obviously, uh, for the people at home, like doing this, what are what are the sessions you're going to be doing here? Oh, so actually, I just have one talk on Wednesday that just kind of uh, discusses some of the uh, uh, the technical challenges that I kind of came across when I was developing uh, FPS games over the past 20 years. So it's a broad uh, broad range of topics. I I, th I think it's like four different topics that I'll be covering, and they they kind of range from programming to kind of art topics. So and they're, they're pretty just broad scope, and nice. uh, yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, uh, Game Developers Conference and all that game development, what do you think has been like the, probably like the greatest innovation in first person shooters like over the last like couple of decades? Uh, the greatest innovation? Um, like, you know, what's changed, the, what's changed the game? You can say Battle Royale if you want. Yeah, you know, no, actually, um, you know, I, I think matchmaking, you know, matchmaking is kind of a big thing. Because I remember 10 years ago, uh, we didn't have matchmaking. And I remember playing, what, back when I was playing Counter-Strike, whenever I would uh, wanted to play the game, I had to sort through all this list of all these servers. And I was like, 
uh, you know, I, I would choose the server with the last people, and it was all, it was kind of weird. And I joined the server, and then the the server had like a bunch of these high level players, and they kicked my ass, and then I'd just cry, and I didn't want to play anymore, right? But nowadays we have this system of matchmaking where you know uh, you can take your your skill level and you can get matched against other players that are equally matched, and that really uh, kind of makes the experience much better because. Uh, when when players are equally matched against play, uh, other players of their same skill level, it it kind of uh, mm, minimizes the effect of them getting like uh, like beaten so bad that they don't want to play anymore. You know, so I, I think matchmaking is such a big uh, important factor in in kind of uh, keeping your player base uh, uh, thriving and, and just not not having them kind of shrink so fast and just get scared and run away because. Yeah, I remember back in the day when I when I played games, and I would join a server, and if I wasn't matched with equal level players, you know, it really made me not want to play the game anymore. It know? sounds like you're talking about Quake. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, but you know, back in those days, we didn't have much choice. You know, yeah. when I got beat up, I couldn't go play another game because there was no other game, right? Yeah. But uh, so in this day and age, matchmaking is so important in, in kind of keeping your players uh, kind of. Uh, engaged. What do you think was the the FPS that really nailed it? Was it like Halo, or who who do you think was the first game that really nailed matchmaking? Uh, I guess for me it was kind of a uh, CS:GO because CS I never Go. did get into the Halo series because they were more on the Xbox. Yeah, they were. Con yeah, they were I was console. more of a PC guy, so yeah, sure. for me matchmaking, the first time I was exposed to matchmaking was CS:GO. Okay. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, that was that was it, it worked so well and so smoothly for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, actually, initially, I remember a lot of my friends they were kind of against matchmaking because they wanted to join servers where they can they knew who they were playing against and they because for them joining a server was more of a community aspect. You yeah, know? you join a, a server that you always join and you, you know the admin and so yeah, we we uh, we pride ourselves at Shack News of having our, our Shack battles. Yeah, exactly. We organize them yeah, on our forum. Yeah, for sure. And, and I remember know. joining like uh, Planet Half Life servers, and yeah, you know, I would I would play the same guys, and you know, I had a rapport with the players I played with. Yeah. So it feels like we've lost that. Yeah, in exactly. A lot of games. These like, days, you you you're just matched with a bunch of strangers, which I suppose is good because they're evenly skill level. So. Uh -huh. Uh, I just want both. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's it's an interesting dilemma because you lose that community aspect of playing the, you know, the people that you you're so familiar with. You could argue that Shack News wouldn't exist if it wasn't for people needing to find Quake servers. Yeah, you exactly. know, because the, the internet back then did not. There was not. Yeah. There was no. There was no matchmaking. There was no. Yep. There's really IRC exactly. and Shack yeah, News yeah. were the places you could find. Back then, I had servers. to go to like Planet Half Life and, yeah. and check their server listing. So mm -hmm. it's a it's an interesting uh, kind of a pivot in how how we kind of uh, interact with uh, other players nowadays. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's almost like we've broadened the community just to be everyone. Yeah. Because yeah. it it's, it's, it's more efficient in that sense. Yeah, yeah. That, that is a good, good point, and it's interesting how when I, when I play a game like Rainbow Six Siege, I don't think I, like, probably, I've played for six months, and I, I don't think I've run across the same person once, you know. But back when I played Counter-Strike, I would always, you know, every week I would play the same guy at least once. So, yeah. so it's, you lose that sort of, like, uh, bond with uh, players, but um, but I think at the same time uh, I think it's worth it to have the the, uh, the matchmaking aspect of being leveled, equally skill leveled. Yeah. See, so, you know, I, I want to ask just like kind of you mentioned with like longevity of esports, mm -hmm. that continuity being important. Yeah. What do you think are some some things that we have left away from the Quake days, from the Counter Strike days, from those early days of FPS, even Duke Three D, mm -hmm. uh, that like regeneration of health, right? Oh, or you yeah. can just go hide and your health regenerates now. Right, Instead right. of health being pickups. <laughs> yeah. Are there, are there games, or, do you think there are mechanics like that that could be brought back to games? Do you think that some of those, we've made it almost too easy? Too easy, yeah. I know, because I, I, it seems like a lot of games these days, they kind of pander to the, the casual players who, who really don't have the patience of, of you know you know when they get shot they don't, they you know they, they want their health to regenerate mm -hmm. but actually it's kind of interesting I do see a lot of games kind of going away from that as well you know like Battlefield doesn't have regenerating health yeah uh, like PUBG like uh, a lot of these battle royale games you have to heal yourself yeah so uh, I do think that uh, games are becoming a bit more uh, realistic and less casual I mean you still have Fortnite you know which is uh -huh. in my mind is one of the most casual FPS games 
today. It's right? not even first person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is another reason why it appeals to such a large uh, player base. Uh, third person is much more uh, uh, appealing. And it's also easy general. to sell backpacks when you're looking at your exactly, backpack. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's uh, that's a big reason why it's third person. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm just kind of curious. You know, you you've been a game developer for a long time. Uh, what's how has the experience changed from when you were first starting out to developing a game in modern times? Yeah. Uh, well, in this day and age, it's harder to take risks uh, because uh, the the game industry is so crowded. It is so competitive, and you can't really uh, like you can't really try to make a risky game or like uh, a game that's so different than the norm because uh, it, it's, it'll be harder for you to uh, market your game to a new player. Because I, I think a lot of players, they kind of gravitate towards games that they can sort of say, oh, this game is sort of like this game, but it's, you know, it's, this, uh, it's kind of the same. Because when, when, and I, I think that's kind of, I think that was one of my failures with my previous game when I made Tactical Intervention. I, I think I made that game too weird and too different, and, and I had a lot of game elements that weren't really uh, um, seen in other games. And I, I remember one of the biggest complaints that I had from my players that play that game was when they, whenever they would start some of the, the, the missions, they had absolutely no idea what to do, and they're like, and they were like, what, what's going on? What's going on? You know, I, because I had this one gameplay mode where you would start in these cars and the cars would chase the, the other enemy team cars. And that was, there was no other game that did that. And when they, a lot of the players that would play that, that game mode, they were just, they got really frustrated and they got really like, I don't, I don't get this game. This, this is nothing like, uh, you know, they cannot, they cannot relate that experience to another game. So, so, uh, so we lost a lot of players because of that learning curve that they, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't, a lot of the players didn't want to put the uh, time into learning that, that new game mode. So, so I think uh, it's hard for, for game developers to, to make a game that's too far from the norm. You need that, those universal mechanics, so to speak. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so everyone can kind of understand it, like kind of speak the same language, if you will. Yeah, I, I, I think so, yeah. That, I think that's kind of why it's easier to make a clone. Like, when, 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 for example, like when PUBG became popular, uh, it was kind of easy for Fortnite to take those gameplay mechanics and just kind of s do a slight refinement on them, and you know, uh, and it, it, it allowed players to kind of uh, relate to. So, so you know, players that played PUBG can go play Fortnite, and they can sort of say, oh, you know, the, they, there was a lot of kind of the similar aspects to it. You know. So, so yeah, I, I think in this day and age, uh, uh, whenever you make a new game, I think it's important not to. Uh, stray too far from the existing formulas. Uh, if you are gonna make a really new game experience, it's important to uh, uh, start small and like, I think start a, as a small mod and kind of like uh, build, build the player base slowly. I think that's kind of what we did with Rust when I worked on a game uh, with my previous company called Facebunch. When we made Rust, uh, I remember Rust, it started out as a small little game with very few players and a lot of the players were very hardcore and dedicated, but the gameplay was so different than what uh, they, uh, like it was that was currently out there. It was just this open world survival type game. It was, I, I guess you can say it was sort of like DayZ, which was another game out there at the same time. But it had a lot of these other elements. It combined RPG with FPS, and it was really different. And I, I think uh, we 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 uh, we experimented with a lot of new game mechanics as well. So, but because it was so different, w the game grew uh, a bit slower. Like it took maybe two or three years for it to reach like the the, the critical mass that it, it's kind of reached right now. Like right now, it's it has some of the highest player numbers it has uh, compared to what it was like three three or four years ago when Rust was first introduced. So so, so I think if a game is gonna really be innovative and really uh, kind of stray from the norm, like a game like Rust, it has to grow uh, at a at a pretty slow rate, and it has to kind of grow like with with a, uh, with the community involvement. At the, at the very early onset. You know, you mentioned starting with a mod, you know, yeah, and yeah. like CS yeah, started off as a mod. And, and, and also and like PUBG started off yeah, as a mod, like the guy yeah. who made it, it's, it was actually a mod of, of, you know, H1Z1 or something, right? Yeah. 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 So and that allows the, the developer to experiment and to get feedback from the community. When you start off as a mod, nobody's expecting the game to be big or, or no, nobody's expected to be so, you know, a, a certain type of game. It allows the developer to just kind of 
work in an open environment with the players and sort of see what works and what doesn't work. And it allows him to kind of shape the game from there. And that's kind of what, what I think that's what, what the guy who made PUBG did. And that's exactly how we made Counter Strike. It just started off small. Do you think? Uh, do you think starting off as a mod makes it more of like a, a labor of love? And do you think that the the audience can understand that or uh, yeah, they receive I, that? Yeah, but I, I don't. I don't think it's a drawing point for that because I don't think players will play a game because oh, this guy it's a labor of love, so I'm gonna play it for him. Ooh. Most games aren't that. <laughs> most gamers aren't that generous. Well, They're you know, very. Well, you know, they they if, have. They have very few time, man. If, if if your grandma makes you cookies, like you can taste the love in the cookies, right? <laughs> yeah, I like, mean you uh, can taste yeah. it yourself if it's your grandma. But uh -huh. other gamers, they're like, that's they're not, not my taste, grandma. I, I don't mean, know. if you share yeah. your cookies with those gamers, yeah, but gonna, trust me, those gamers they don't give a shit about your grandma, man. No, no. No, I, no, trust me. I, I know it sounds very sentimental. That your, your grandma's baking cookies, but yeah, I, 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 I trust me. Nobody, a lot of gamers these days. I mean, it's like you know, I don't, I don't have a connection to the developer. I'm only gonna play that game for as long as that game entertains me. So that's why I think uh, game like mods, they sound very uh, like you know sentimental and very to the, from the heart. But honestly, they grow because they they grow. Uh, because the developer is so in touch with the community and he lessens the community. It's just about making a good game. Yeah, it has nothing to do with grandma's with cookies. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. I had just one last question for you about this FPS and kind of where it's at right now. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your history really revolves around multiplayer games. Yeah, yeah. And we're seeing uh, Call of Duty recently did mm. not ship with a campaign. Yeah. How do you feel players. about the state of single did you put did you ever get into playing single player fps oh, yeah. back in the day uh, yeah i still i still play a few i love them like far cry 4 do you, do you think there's still a place for that oh yeah 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 i mean i think the reason like call of duty uh, focused more on the single player uh, on that multiplayer i think it was just kind of a you know i don't want to uh, you know i, I don't want to assume but i'm just kind of like if you if you if i had to guess for the from for for me i think they just sort of felt they wanted to do something that was cheaper you know because it costs much less to make a multiplayer game compared to single player game i mean your your development costs get cut probably by a third yeah i know. think they ended up just adding multiple multiplayer yeah mo it's, it's like much the cheaper zombies it's mode, much cheaper and yeah they and, and the payoff is better i mean the payoff is greater because mm -hmm. you know they realize oh mo most of the players just play it just for the multiplayer and now that they can sell skins, yeah. they can generate much more revenue by just making a multiplayer game. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're starting to see more game companies kind of focus on the multiplayer because it's just cheaper from from a from a bottom line standpoint. So it's definitely higher margin than making yeah, single it's player. definitely higher margin. Yeah. So unless you have like a banger like Doom or something that can, that can yeah, sell yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean like. And like when you look at games like Doom, the, the, and I think one of the reasons why Bethesda is able to make Doom a single player game is Doom is such an old IP, it's such an uh, established IP that they have a very uh, huge player base and you know, they don't have to do as much marketing. So they can, uh, so you, you still have these large IPs that, that I do believe have the uh, uh, capacity to make single player games. and. And, and drive a lot enough players to play them so that it becomes financially vi viable for them to do that. Mm -hmm. But for 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 like uh, like indie developers to make single player games, uh, I, I don't know. It, it, I think yeah, uh, financially it, it's it's much more uh, involving. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and the, the rate the, the, the rate of return is, is lower. Uh, when you look at a game like The Division Two, which some people kind of look at as as single player but also multiplayer as well, mm -hmm. uh, it has kind of aspects of both, right? So uh, I think the reason that they kept the, the like the multiplayer aspect is to keep the player base engaged. So you you still have a lot of players playing it for a long period of time, even though it does have a single player component. I think they want players to continue to play it even after they've beaten the game. And a lot of these games, not necessarily. Just so basically, the they've kind of uh, kind of just lengthened the long tail of uh -huh. the the player time engagement. Because usually, if a player plays a single player game, he's done within 20 minutes or 20 hours, right? Or at, at most, maybe 10 hours, right? Uh -huh. But when you look at a game like uh, like The Division, you know, the the long tail of it is probably like on average 60 hours, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've got players playing it that much longer, they're engaged more and they're more likely to buy cosmetics and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, so I think the days of seeing traditional single player games only like Half-Life where it's kind of like, you know, 10 hours and that kind of stuff. So just to wrap up, yeah. your advice to, let's say there's an indie dev out there, you know, this is GDC, they're probably, they're, they might even come to your talk. Oh, okay. Uh, and they want to make an FPS game. 
your advice would be don't bring up grandma's cookies and what else? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, kind of try to think about the longevity of your game because in this day and age, player engagement is so important. You, you want players to stay engaged to your, uh, your game for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which it, it's difficult because of just the competitive nature of the, what we live in these days. You have to keep players engaged for as long as possible. Yep, with awesome so, emotes. So yeah, so basically uh, update your game, like add new content to it uh, on a regular basis. Yeah.